please put your hands together for Miss Bellick uh, Orlika. My name is Liliana Bellagorlico, and this past summer, I got the amazing opportunity to witness and study something I had never really thought much about. The Arctic is something I have always been passionate about, ever since I was a little girl. Everything about the North fascinates me, and growing up in a family where pursuing your interests is encouraged, it became my obsession to learn anything and everything about the cold and isolated environment. It was because of this passion that I was inspired to study one of the most prominent issues in the Canadian Arctic and turn it into my masterworks project. Today in my presentation, I will be talking about food security in Northern Canada and how it has affected the Inuit people, a project which I call Growing North. In my presentation today, I will answer the question, what is food security, as well as how we experience food insecurity in the Arctic, the problem, and possible solutions. <coughs> Part one, what is food security? By definition, food insecurity or food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to a sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. There's a recognized importance of something called the food system. The food system is comprised of five parts, production, distribution, access, consumption, and disposal. In order for a person to be food secure, the food system itself must work well. If something within the food system becomes broken, like food does not get to the distributor on time, prices may be raised, and everything in the food system gets altered. This is one of the main causes of food insecurity. In July of 2015, my mom and I traveled for 12 hours on four planes to reach the remote fjord of Pangnirtung in Nineveh. Pangnirtung is a small hamlet known for its hiking trails, national parks, and Arctic char, and is located 2,000 kilometers north of Ottawa on a northern island called Baffin Island. As well as being one of the smallest northern communities with a population of 1,400, one-third the size of Bowen Island, Pangnirtung is extremely isolated and is accessible only by small twin-engine airplanes and a large tanker called a sea lift, which stops by the hamlet twice a year when and if the sea ice has retreated. We arrived at the hamlet in the late afternoon, but the 23-hour daylight meant that the sun was as bright as in the morning. You can imagine we didn't get a very good sleep that night. <laughs> My mom and I had decided right from the beginning of our trip that we wanted to experience the 10 days with no expectations and a large amount of openness. Unfortunately, keeping an open mind meant I struggled from day one. For those of you who have ever fed me, you'll know that I'm a vegetarian. I knew that by going to the Arctic, I'd be visiting a place where caribou hunting, Arctic char processing, and seal trapping is a very prominent way of life. However, I had no idea of just how great the impact would be on me and my lifelong diet. Upon arriving at our homestay, we were greeted by a 78-year-old woman named Hannah Tatuajik. As we settled into our small sunlit room, Hannah cooked from frozen the saltiest pizza I have ever eaten in my entire life. <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever had Hawaiian-style ham and pineapple pizza, but I figured with such a small ser serving of pork, if I had to eat meat like that every day, it wouldn't actually be that hard. Hannah treated me like her own grandchild, calling me baby and honey in her thick, deep-voiced accent. However, she acted very maternal in other ways as well piling food onto my plate even when I said I had had enough. If I refused to eat more food, she would scold, you know vegetarian, I hate vegetarian. <laughs> and would act very shocked and displeased with me. In order for us not to have our cover blown, I ate everything she piled on my plate and made comments on how amazing the pot roast was and how I loved the bacon she served us at breakfast and especially how I would miss her caribou stew when I returned back home. While I secretly covered my meals with so much HP and soy sauce that I wasn't physically capable of tasting anything else. It was very interesting to see how different the meals were from what I eat at home, even apart from the meat element. Our family doesn't buy white bread, and we only occasionally buy non-organic peanut butter or milk. We drink a lot of soy milk as well, all luxuries for people in the North. The foods I ate in the North were all extremely processed and unlike the foods I eat at home. 
white bread, craft peanut butter, canned blueberries, and hot dogs you can buy for about a dollar in BC. Hannah got the privilege of buying meat at a, le at a less but still expensive price compared to the rest of Pangnertung, but only because she ran a B&B. &B. In fact, Hannah was probably one of the wealthiest single women in Pangnertung, and her house was not even half the size of this church. <clears throat> A 2014 Globe and Mail article stated that 7 in 10 Inuit preschoolers live in a food insecure household, while approximately 80% of households in the north are deemed food insecure. In contrast, an alternate survey shows how only 10% of the rest of Canadians experience food insecurity. While visiting the Arctic, I got the chance to see some of the effects that not having a reliable enough access to food can have on people. Though I knew of the problem, it was still shocking to see the effect it had on the people. The first main reason that food insecurity exists in the Arctic is because of how expensive food and other items are to buy. This is usually a result of how difficult things are to ship or fly up north, especially in a place like Pangnertung. In Pangnertung, you can buy food from two places, the Northern Store and the Arctic Co-op. The Northern Store is built like a typical small grocery store and even has an attached Kentucky Fried Chicken. You can find most food products here. At the co-op, you can find products ranging from car tires to couches to bags of apples or umbrellas. <coughs> the two stores, at first glance, may offer many different items, but there was one thing in common. While shopping at either place, you experience a phenomenon called sticker shock. The shelves are almost bare, and what food does sit on them is extremely expensive, at double or even triple the price we pay here in the South for our groceries. As well, like the food I experienced at Hannah's, most was typically heavily processed and prepackaged cheap foods being sold for an expensive price. While in the North, I conducted an experiment where I made a list of simple meals a family of four could typically eat in a week. I based the ideas for these meals on what I typically eat at home. I then went to both the Arctic Co-op and the Northern Store to record the prices of the foods needed for the menus I'd created. On the left of the column, you can see the Northern prices, and on the right are the prices from a Walmart in North Vancouver. On that particular week, Due to bad weather and the planes not being able to fly properly, many of the foods I wanted to include in my meal plan weren't actually available to buy from the Arctic Co-op. For example, I wasn't able to buy blueberries, strawberries, cucumber, tahini, any sort of dried fruit, spinach, zucchini, avocado, breadsticks, or chickpeas. To be fair, many people in Pangnertung eat traditional wild-caught food and different kinds of meals, so a lot of them do not have use for luxuries like tahini or breadsticks. I knew the prices would be high, but they well exceeded my expectations. I was shocked to see the prices that people had to pay to buy the foods we can get so cheaply here in British Columbia. Buying eggs in Pangnertung meant you would be paying an extra 20% cost versus here in Vancouver, and for celery, up to 287%. It was incredible to me when I saw the comparison of the prices. With some prices, there wasn't a huge difference. For example, lettuce is $3 here and $4 up north. Other prices, though, were ridiculously different. I know that most of the students here have been to the general store here on Bowen, where you can buy a bag of candy for about a dollar. In North Vancouver, you can buy one, bank, one box of Rice Krispie cereal at Walmart for a price equivalent to about three bags of candy. However, in Pangnertung, that same box of cereal would be equal to 18 bags of candy. Vanilla ice cream here is three and a half bags of candy, but in Pangnertung, is 16 bags. In BC, we can buy sugar for 12 bags of candy, but in Pangnertown, you would have to pay the same amount of money as 47 bags of candy. In full total, the observations and results I got from the grocery store here in Vancouver amounted to $239, compared to the final price I got in Pangnertown at a total of $563. This is an incredible 324 price difference for a week's worth of the exact same food. Another 2014 Glow and Mail article pointed out that the median income for a non-Aboriginal worker in the North is $86,600 per year, while for the Inuit is only about $19,900. This is a fourfold difference. It hardly needs to be said that such a discrepancy makes food shopping incredibly difficult for Aboriginal workers. The government of Nunavut believes that they have taken a number of initiatives in order to pay for the expensive housing, 
food, and other necessities such as gas. Many others, however, disagree and point out that families still have to pay extremely high costs in order to live with such a small amount of items. Workers from companies in provinces such as British Columbia, Manitoba, or Ontario get paid a much higher amount of money if they work in northern communities for a period of time. This is called a northern living allowance. These communities can be anywhere north of the 60th parallel, therefore in extremely remote places like Pangnertung or Grace Fjord. But most workers end up in much larger, more populated areas such as Iqaluit or Iglulik. These workers are usually doctors or nurses, construction workers or teachers. They fill technical jobs that northern communities need to provide basic services. Many, many Aboriginal people don't get access to a good education and don't have the money to travel out of the north for more business opportunities. Another aspect that contributes to the high price of food is the obvious reason of transportation. There are only two ways in which food gets transported to remote regions of Nunavut. These are by plane and by sea lift. A sea lift is a large tanker that travels to the places in Nunavut not accessible by road. These boats can bring over 17,000 tons of cargo to northern communities and carry purchased items like non-perishable foods, housing, ATVs, or boats. Many of the members of the community can request and pay in advance for items they would like brought to them. All perishable foods, such as fresh fruits and vegetables, animal products, and dairy and other alternatives are flown into the community twice a day in small planes. Hannah's daughter, a woman named Julia Tatuajuk, was awaiting the red pickup truck she had ordered many months previously. However, not only would she have to cover the cost of the truck, but an extra $5,000 worth of shipping costs. When I was in the Arctic, I got the chance to go boating out into the surrounding Arctic Ocean of Baffin Island. Even though I could see the huge expanse of Baffin Island, it was still amazing to see how isolated I was in the middle of this ice-covered ocean. It just happened that this particular summer, there was an abnormal abundance of ice flows on the ocean. So much, in fact, that our guide, Peter Killebuck, wasn't able to take us much further than the mouth of the fjord due to huge chunks of ice. Though the views were spectacular, this meant that the sealess visit would be delayed for weeks, even months, until it was finally able to access the hamlet. As well, many tourist ships were not able to come even close to Baffin Island, meaning thousands of lost tourist dollars. So what does this mean? In a small community like Pangnertung, where there are few business opportunities, many people earn income by making and selling traditional clothing like mukluks or pang hats, or traditional carvings of seal, walrus, and many other traditional pieces of art. Similar to the people here on Bowen Island, these people rely on tourism in order to stay in business, but unlike us, need this money to bring home a meal to their family that night. In the 1960s, the government of Nunavut took steps forward by creating a subsidizing program in the north called Nutrition North. A subsidy is a sum of money granted by the government to assist a business or a people so that the price of an item or service can remain low. Nutrition North meant to reduce the price of certain foods so that access to nutritional foods was not an issue for people. They allowed subsidies to be provided for vegetables and fruits, grain products, milk and alternative dairy products, country or traditional foods, non-prescription drugs, and infant foods. As well, if you were to order your foods online, meaning they would get shipped or flown in for you, shipping costs would be the responsibility of the customer. However, Nutrition North is approved to pass on an additional 5% subsidy to cover some costs of the packaging. The subsidized foods and items were especially important to subsidize as they are difficult to access in the north. The cold and harsh climate of the Arctic tundra makes it impossible to harvest crops outdoors, which introduces the next solution. In the summer of 2014, four students from Ryerson University in Ontario visited Repulse Bay in central Nunavut. They wanted to sustainably address and raise awareness regarding an issue in northern Canada. After talking to 75 people of the 750 people population, the four decided that they would raise money in order to introduce greenhouses to the Arctic. Through donations from Ryerson University and other campaigns, the students were able to raise over $239,000. The community donated land and requested that they grow cucumbers, onions, peppers, and tomatoes. When the greenhouses arrived in August of 2015, 
They decided the food grown in them would be sold for half the price of the vegetables in the grocery stores. Their project is nonprofit, and they hope in the future to have greenhouses located in every single northern community. People like the students from Ryerson University are those who can greatly impact the world in a visible manner. But as individuals whose own knowledge is the most powerful tool we have, what can we do? As people who live in southern Canada, it is our current approach to food security in the north that is the main contributing factor as to why people live so insecurely. Food security is so important mainly because it strikes to the hearts of what every person in the 21st century should have access to, a reliable access to healthy and affordable food. Take a look around you today. It is with great reason that I'd assume very few of you even knew what food security was before I introduced you to it, let alone the fact that a place like Pangerton even exists. All it takes is for individuals to make the switch in their brain that these remote places face challenges that aren't hidden problems. We cannot pretend that problems like this don't exist, especially in our own country. We are all so fortunate in this room to have the opportunities that we do and the abilities to do so many things. But across our country, there are families who don't get enough to eat at the end of the day. Men and women who are struggling to feed their children each night. These people are Canadians, but the Arctic is like a third world country. In some areas of the North, the effects of food insecurity will have more effect than in others, but the fundamental actions and problems it creates will create the same outcomes. Thanks to new technology and minds, we are making advances. <coughs> Many opportunities are now a reality for Inuit people like subsidies and fresh vegetables. In comparison to where we stood before, we have made many advances, but we still do have a long way to go. I believe the most important thing anyone can do is to be aware that though we are generally not affected by the food consumption of the Inuit, they are affected by our choices and actions. Every decision we as a people make will tie directly to the future of the Inuit. If each person in the room looks beyond their own individual interest, we can go get lengths. Young minds and new technologies can help to make positive changes. For example, greenhouses being introduced to the Arctic more effective subsidies and governmental attention can and will bring positive change to the North. I struggled with seeing how great a problem food security was before I went up to the Arctic, and six months prior to my flight, I didn't even know Pangnertung existed. I had no idea what food security was, but now that I do, my eyes are a lot more open than they were before. Each individual is capable of change and making a change. Though it may not seem like it, one person's actions can influence thousands of people or even make a significant difference to an entire industry. It is with the knowledge I have supplied you with today that I hope you go forwards with an open mind and develop knowledge. We as Canadians and humans with such privileged lives are the ones who can truly change things for the other people in our country because waking up is not a selfish pursuit of happiness. It is a revolutionary stance from the inside out for the benefit of all beings in existence. In conclusion, I would like to thank all the hardworking and inspirational people who helped to make my project a reality. To my internal advisor, Ted Spear, and to my external advisors, David Willis and Denise Lockett. This project has become what it is today, thanks to your talent and generosity. Thank you for always keeping me on track and for sending me interesting articles and photos. To my parents and brother, thank you for always inspiring me to pursue my interests and for encouraging me to take every opportunity and of course to my mom for taking the trip with me and inspiring me along the way. Thank you to my class for standing by me the whole way and for your genuine interest in my trip and project. <laughs> A very special thank you to someone who first mentioned the name Pangner Tongue to me and who started me on the path of this whole project. Tom Paragadoff, thank you. And finally to you, thank you for coming today and allowing my project to become a reality. going to make a quick announcement about Ms. Bellic Orlico because she has done a fantastic job and met all the requirements of her Masterworks component.